The history of math is our intellectual foundation to understanding science. Science. Beautiful, awesome, wonderful science. It's the creative foundation to our ineffable future. Hi, I'm Gabrielle Burchak, and this is my podcast, Math, Science, History. send out a special thank you to all of you who are listening to this podcast. It has been really exciting to see my listening audience grow, and I am really honored to have my podcast be part of your world. This podcast is made possible through my Audible affiliate account at audibletrial.com slash math science history, where you can go and receive a free audiobook download as well as a 30-day free trial. But this podcast is also sustained through your generous contributions, which I am so very grateful for. You too can visit me at mathsciencehistory.com. Click on that coffee cup on the right side of my website and buy me a cup of coffee or two or three or four because every cup of coffee that you buy keeps this podcast up and running. The apocalyptic month was June. The year was 451 CE. A red point of light appeared in the sky as a fiery stream of light followed its path. Three weeks later, Attila the Hun invaded France when it was under Rome's jurisdiction. It was only a matter of time until Rome would fall and fade into history. About 600 years later, another red point of light appeared in the night sky. Aylmer of Malmesbury wrote, You've come, have you? You've come, you source of tears to many mothers, you evil. I hate you. It is long since I saw you, but as I see you now, you are much more terrible, for I see you brandishing the downfall of my country. I hate you. And within a year, English King Harold Godwinson and his army marched south from Yorkshire to Hastings, where they encountered the Normans as they invaded his land. In that battle, King Harold died when an arrow went through his eye and pierced his brain. Then there was that time on May 6, 1910, when that same red ball of light approached our Earth's sky as King Edward VII suffered a series of heart attacks and died. However, in that same month, as the ball grew brighter and approached closer to our planet, on May 19th, Oliver Wendell Holmes and his wife, Fanny, went to a naval observatory on Massachusetts Avenue to observe this ball of light. They ended up partying until 2 in the morning, and then they went home. Nothing exciting really happened. So did this red ball of light have the power to bring about death and destruction? Or was it just simply a fiery ball in the sky? What was this giant fiery red ball? For the record, this fiery red ball is not really a ball. It's nine miles long and five miles wide. And it's referred to as Halley's Comet. This beautiful comet has been passing by our planet approximately every 76 years, and its presence was possibly noted as early as 466 BCE in ancient Greece. Even so, its appearance has led to the pandemonium and fear that the comet would either destroy us, gas us to death, or indicate that bad, horrible, destructive things would happen. Even worse, its appearance led to irrational expertise. As one famed astronomer, John John Herschel suggested that the comet be packed in a portmanteau, which is a fancy word for suitcase. His suggestion, posed in 1910, led to a hilarious response from the New York Times asking its readers, who will undertake the packing? There is a marvelous article written by Matt Simon of Wired Magazine called Fantastically Wrong That Time People Thought a Comet Would Gas Us All to Death. I'll also post the link on my website at mathsciencehistory.com if you want to read it. It's great. So why is it called Halley's Comet and why does it come about every 76 years? In 1705, the English astronomer Edmund Halley was observing several comets using Newton's theories of gravitation and planetary motion. At this time, many people believed believed that comets only made a single pass through our solar system. However, Halley had discovered that reports of a comet had passed in 1531, 1607, and 1682, and they all had a similar orbit. This led him to propose that it wasn't a coincidence and that 
These weren't separate comets, but rather this one comet was making a return trip every 76 years. Thus, he predicted that this particular comet would pass by in 1758, and he was right. It was sighted in late 1758 and passed perihelion in March of 1759. What this means is that it was closest to the sun in March 1759. Sadly, Halley did not get to see this comet, as he had passed away 17 years earlier. Even so, the comet was named in his honor. The comet does not pass by exactly every 76 years. Actually, its orbital period fluctuates between 74.5 years and 79 years. The comet moves backwards, and so it's moving opposite to the Earth's motion. It has an elliptical orbit with the sun at one focus of the ellipse. In other words, the sun is at one side of the narrow ellipse. So, unlike the Earth with an almost circular orbit with the sun in the center, Halley's Comet travels about 12.2 billion kilometers, also 7.6 billion miles. It travels that far in a narrow ellipse. I'll post a GIF and a graph on my website, again at mathsciencehistory.com, in case you want a visual to see how it's moving. The comet's orbit varies because of the gravitation from the planets that it passes by. Nevertheless, Halley's Comet stays the course as it speeds up towards the sun and then travels to the outer reaches of our solar system, past Neptune's orbit, and then back again. And... Like an old familiar friend, Halley's Comet visits us every 76 years or so. Since the beginning of the Julian calendar, the comet has appeared on its designated year with astounding accuracy. I was actually going to post a spreadsheet and started to build one <laughs> until I noticed that a similar spreadsheet had already been made and is on Wikipedia. It's fantastic, and you can find it by simply looking up Halley's Comet, spelled H-A-L-L-E-Y, or by finding the link on my website, of course. What excites me most about observing the spreadsheet and looking at the accuracy of Halley's predictions is that this comet has been observed for thousands of years. On some level, these viewings represent a connection between us and history. And it's really exciting to think that so many brilliant scientists that we have only read about are connected to us and have seen the same comet that we can also see. And it's not just the comet, it's the stars and the moon and everything in our galaxy. We are connected to our histories through those tiny fireballs that paint our night sky. All of those ancient and historical figures who have changed the world in a positive way, who have been inspired by the stars and its brilliant movement. We have that same inspiration to behold. Though we may not get to see Halley's Comet this year, we will get to see the Eta Aquarids meteor shower on the very early morning of May 5th so it's worth getting up for. And as far as Halley's Comet, the next time it'll be around to visit us will be 2061, 41 years from now. It's been thousands of years since the very first observation of Halley's Comet, but those thousands of years are a tiny time stamp in which this gorgeous traveler has been recorded. And so as a result, we get to behold the same dance in the night sky that Copernicus, Dumay, Galileo, Hypatia, and many other brilliant scientists have looked upon. I'm Gabrielle Burchak. This podcast has been brought to you by Caffeine, delicious, wonderful, nectar of the gods caffeine, coffee, tea, coffee, candy, you name it. I love it. Thank you for listening to Math Science History. If you like what you are listening to, please remember to subscribe and leave a review. I would really appreciate that. If you are interested in reading more about the history of math and science, please come visit me at mathsciencehistory.com. And while you are there, if you like what you're listening to, please feel free to click on that coffee button and buy me a cup of coffee. Until next week, carpe diem!